driving as we all do every day on different in different kinds of uh, situations it's really uh, almost you need all of intelligence to do it mm -hmm. you need common sense mm -hmm. and common sense is something that computers lack there's a quote i have in my book which is from ba back in the the 60s or something someone said that artificial intelligence is at least a hundred Nobel prizes away. Oh, that was like the only right person in the history of right. this, right? This is Brain Inspired. Hello, everyone. This is me, Paul Middlebrooks. Today, my guest is Melanie Mitchell. Melanie's a computer scientist a machine learning researcher, and a complexity expert. She's a uh, professor at Portland State University and an external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute, where all that complexity work happens. We kind of uh, jump around and cover a lot of ground today. Melanie wrote the award-winning book on complexity called Complexity, A Guided Tour, which has been out now for almost a decade. She's just finished writing a new book called Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans, which you'll have to keep your eye out for since you can't pre-order it yet and it's in the final stages of copy editing and such. We talk about the current shortcomings of deep learning uh, with respect to general AI, which she writes about in her recent New York Times op-ed that you may well have read. Melanie has provided the world with a valuable service, uh, providing free online education in the field of complexity at complexityexplorer.org through the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, they have a lot of free courses and, and tutorials. Uh, it's really a, a great resource, so you should check that out. We also uh, talk about complexity during the show, the topic in general, uh, and the role that it has and or may have uh, moving forward uh, among AI and neuroscience. And then, of course, Melanie graciously answered some of my more speculative questions at the end as well. Okay, and I tried something new this week. I uh, brought the old joke of the show back, but instead of putting it in the intro here, I tried it out live on my guest, Melanie. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the most valuable skills I learned in graduate school was how to give a talk either a talk describing my own research findings or even in a journal club, for instance, summarizing and critiquing a paper. And when you give a talk, especially early on in your development, as you know, there are two excruciating moments. If you're like me, the most excruciating moment is just before the talk, uh, that nervous anticipation before beginning, waiting as those seconds tick by, waiting to be introduced, etc. Uh, but there can be Another excruciating moment, and that is after the talk, when you ask whether there are any questions, and what follows is often a silence that seems to last for an hour before someone finally asks a question. And that silence, you have to get comfortable with it. Well, I felt that deafening eternal silence once more, but this time it was at the end of my attempt at AI humor. You can judge for yourself how comfortable I felt with it, but I can tell you this, it's never good when you have to explain the joke to someone. <laughs> but screw it. I left it in. I left the bombing joke in. Well, I appreciated Melanie's response, actually. She makes no attempt to give a fake courtesy laugh, <laughs> and she has a good sense of humor, as you'll hear. And I appreciated having her on the show. I think that you will, too. There are lots of links and information in the show notes this episode, which you can find at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 22. You can also support this ad-free podcast by contributing 2 or $4 per month through Patreon. Just go to braininspired.co and click on the red Patreon button there. The support continues to trickle in. It is wonderful to know that you value this show enough to contribute to it, so Thank you to those who have contributed, and thank you in advance to those of you who contribute moving forward. Okay, guys, uh, enjoy the conversation and carry on with all the hard work that I know that you are doing. 
Remember, it's all a process and it's all worth the time and effort you're putting into it. But you already know that. All right, here's Melanie. Melanie Mitchell, thank you for being on the podcast today. Oh, very happy to be here. So I will have introduced you in it, uh, during the introduction, and it may well have taken most of the hour, but uh, we'll introduce you more in a second here. But just to not bury the lead, I, I want to know, first of all, how the reaction has been from your recent New York Times op-ed about how dumb AI is these days. <laughs> Well, I've gotten a lot of reaction, as you can imagine, uh, both uh, mostly positive, a uh, little bit of pushback from AI folks. The uh, a oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. A little bit of the push. The pushback is mostly, oh, yes, we all already know that, that of course that's true, but you know, th there's a huge amount of progress being made every, every day in AI and, uh, there's no reason for pessimism. That's kind of the pushback. It's interesting. I guess the AI section in the New York Times is a thing now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's got its own its own section, its own dedicated reporter and so on. Actually, my neighbor brought your article up and then and that's what I said to him as I said, I think AI researchers all know that already, you know, and so it'd, it'd be interesting to find out if they don't or what proportion believes otherwise. Right. I mean, I think people who actually work in the field um, agree with everything I said. I mean, I, I don't think there's a question about that. But the question is sort of what do we do in response? And, and how, are we going along the right path now with deep learning? Or is there something else we need? Or do we need to do something completely different? And there's all kinds of debates about that. But on the other hand, <clears throat> I don't think the general public knows what to think. Okay, but they don't ever know what to think about <laughs> any science topic, really. That's true. But even, you know, people who are educated in science, they get so many mixed messages about AI and what how far it's gotten and what its capabilities are. And we get all these headlines telling us that, you know, AI recognizes objects better than humans, or it's better <laughs> than humans at X, Y, Z. And none of the nuances or caveats really come through. Right. And on the other hand, we, you know, we hear that AI is, you know, you, you actually interact with things like Alexa or Siri, and you see that these things don't really understand <laughs> what you're saying. Right. The same could be said for my crazy aunt, you know? But that's a different story. That, so okay. <laughs> I might argue with that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know your aunt, but <laughs> yeah, believe me, you wouldn't argue. But the, uh, okay, so let's back up, and and we might get into some of the more nuanced issues in that regard. And, and let me just introduce you a little bit more. So you're a professor at Portland State University. Uh, I've loved Portland every time I've been, and you're an external professor at Santa at the famed Santa Fe Institute. You are a computer scientist, uh, sort of at the core, but you're an expert in complexity science and machine learning, and you have projects in modern machine learning techniques that we could talk about. I'm sure you're tired of hearing this, but you did graduate work with uh, John Holland of genetic algorithm fame, and you did work in that regard too. And just as a side, he figured prominently in a book that I cannot find because I can't remember the name of it, but it was about the history of money. And I guess economics as well. And he had genetic algorithms had something to do with figuring out some. It was fascinating. It was a fascinating ah. book. You wouldn't think it would be because it's about money. But okay. And you did your PhD dissertation work with uh, Douglas Hofstadter mm -hmm. uh, of Gödel Escherbach fame. And could you just pronounce G E B Gödel Escherbach? Gödel Escherbach. Okay. You got it. Okay. Thank it goodness. Perfect. And you actually read the whole thing. How did you achieve uh. this? It took a while, I admit. <laughs> I, I read it um, right after college, or sort of during and after college. And it was just fascinating to me. It was like the best book I'd ever read, the most engaging and uh, mind-opening book. And you never had to put it down and start over a few months later? It, it just really drew you in? Yeah, it, it absolutely drew me in. I had a little bit more... I mean, I, I was a... Um, I majored in math in college, and right. so I had some of the math background, and I'd already encountered Gödel's theorem, so I knew a little bit about that stuff. So it wasn't like the math put me off. 
And the verbosity didn't put you off. No, not at all. Okay. I loved it. <laughs> okay, so that, that, maybe there are two kinds of people in the world. I cannot get through the book. I, I've tried uh, three or four times, and I appreciate uh -huh. it. And and I liked uh, Metamagical Femmes as well. Uh, but those are more, you know, short, shorter snippets, I suppose, parlays into yeah. the, the material. Well, that's very impressive. And and maybe you crossed that threshold, and then you've soared ever since. <laughs> it reminds me, do you know the... Uh, uh, the professor Terence Deacon. Have you heard of him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So he wrote a book called Incomplete Nature. Don't tell me you've read that as well. No, I haven't, but okay. I've heard of it. Well, I'd love to hear what your take is on that because it's a it's a tour de force as well. It's a tome, but whereas Gödel Escher Bach is very accessible and readable, this is just opaque. And it's you know he has really great theories. And you really want to get be able to get through it, but it's written in such a manner. I'm not sure that it was ever edited, for instance. Uh, so it's just really difficult. So pick that one up and we'll talk again in a year okay. and see, see what your experience is. <laughs> okay, sounds so, good. <laughs> so like I said, you're an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute uh, where complexity is is the, the theme. And you launched what's called the Complexity Explorer in 2011, and you were the first to teach an Intro to Complexity course, uh, which is a free course offering through the Santa Fe Institute and through complexityexplorer.org. You're also a well-regarded author of Complexity, a guided tour, which is in my Amazon cart right now. And in contrast to what we were just talking about, it gets rave reviews how well written it is and how accessible it is, even though it has this really large breadth. So congratulations, uh, belated oh. congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I know that you have a new book coming out uh, about pig farming in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Is that what it's? <laughs> that, that's the other Melanie Mitchell, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so just what's your new book uh, coming no, out my, about? My new book is uh, on artificial intelligence. Um, it's called Artificial Intelligence, a guide for thinking humans. It has it has a title now. Yes, it has a title, Great. and um, it's essentially done. The editing process is now essentially done. Wow! Uh, and now the, I guess the the final copy copy editing has to be done, and the uh, production of the book and all of this takes a long time, and it's going to be out in early fall twenty nineteen. So it can't be pre ordered right now. Unfortunately, no. I'm just... Okay. When it is available, I'll have to have you back on and just just to talk about that. But so yeah. this <clears throat> this would be terrifying to me. The idea, because I've thought about making sort of an introductory online course for, you know, the overview of topics in deep learning and AI. And I'm just terrified that as soon as I would finish it, it would just be a moot point. Yeah, that's an interesting question is like, how fast is the field actually moving? And there's, um, in some sense, it's moving very fast. There's thousands and thousands of new papers every year. And it's really hard to keep up with everything that's going. On the other hand, if you look at it kind of the forest instead of the trees, I don't think it's moving all that fast, to be honest, mm -hmm. in terms of how fast, how close we're getting to what many people would consider sort of true AI, AI that is like the kind we see in the movies, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right. Human level AI, people call it, you know, all kinds of different names, but AI that really, um, in some sense, uh, understands the world in the way that we do and can deal with the world in the way that we humans can. So there's, a, so there's progress in very narrow areas. and in very narrow areas, AI is uh, exceeding human ability. You know, we've we've seen that for many years with, uh, for instance, playing chess. Right now, we have playing Go, uh, certain video games. Um, but in more everyday kinds of tasks, you know, there's been a huge improvement in speech recognition. Right, we've seen that, although it's still not at human level, uh, contrary to some headlines. Uh, it has trouble with accents. It has trouble with noise in the background and so on. Right. Uh, and there's been some huge improvement in some aspects of computer vision and uh, translation of languages. But it's still very far from being at the level of humans and really autonomous uh, That in the, in the sense that we're able to trust it completely and not have to make corrections after the fact. 
okay, you know, I was thinking we might start with complexity, but let's go ahead and go down this AI road, and then we'll come back to complexity, and then circle around and, and talk about them together, hopefully. And I was going to save this for later, but sometimes during the show, uh, I you, the only reason I really do this show is because I so I can come up with AI jokes. Can I try <laughs> my, my latest on you here? Yeah, right, please. First, first try here. So you ready? Yeah. Um, all right. So, so these two uh, robots, uh, Wenon and Judith, were talking to each other, and Wenon says, "Oh, Judith, it's been really rough for me lately. Everywhere I look, I just see spots. Every like everywhere I look, I see spots." And Judith looks at Wenon, and she's like, "Oh, that sounds so awful. Have you seen uh, your machine uh, learning technician?" And Wenon says, "No, just spots." Okay, I'm gonna. <laughs> that one needs some tuning up. Uh, <laughs> I'll enter the rim shot there. It's a meant to be a joke about how ungeneralizable uh, in language, especially, <laughs> especially. So the original joke goes: the guy's talking to his friend and says, "All I see is spots," and his friend says, "Oh, have you seen a doctor?" And then his friend says, "Oh, no, just spots." So that's something that more we'd, uh, we'd recognize. Okay. I'm still putting the rim shot in. <laughs> yeah. So, so, okay. any, so this is kind of what your New York Times article uh, op-ed was about. And you've given talks uh, about this same subject. And I'll link to one in the show notes and you link to it on your website, which will also be linked in the show notes, on the current limitations of AI like we were just talking about here. And you point out that we have seen this movie before this excitement of, oh, we're on the brink. And then, and then we have to pull back because it's followed by disappointment. So there's this oscillation and excitement and disappointment. And you think that we're prepping for another disappointment. I, I don't know if you'd call it an AI winter, but that we need to put the brakes on our optimism, perhaps, with our current state. Yeah. I mean, you see it already happening, especially, for instance, in the field of self-driving cars that, you know, for several years, we've been People have been predicting, oh, we're going to have self-driving cars in, you know, a year, in just a, you know, a few months. By 2020, we'll have, you know, auton fully autonomous self-driving cars. It's very. We do have self-driving cars, but they're not ubiquitous. Well, and they're not fully autonomous. True, true. The term self-driving car, if you sort of ask a, a, a non expert person, what does that mean? They would say, oh, you get into the car and it drives you around and you don't have to do anything. You can just like watch a movie in the back or sleep or right. take a nap. Well, we're pretty far from that now. And the self-driving car companies, in fact, are taking steps back. And if you wish, if you like, you know, AI puns, they're putting the brakes on <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> the, the original claims, you know, the company Waymo for example, they just launched a self-driving taxi service in a small area in, I think, Chandler, Arizona, hmm. where the regulations are pretty lax. But they, instead of having the car, they said originally where there's going to be no safety driver, you know, no human that, need, that can take over when needed. But now they put safety drivers back in the cars because they realize that they really need them. Well, it's a, it's a huge liability, too. I mean, even profit-wise, they're going to get bankrupted by accidents, right? And so if they if they just take that away, and it's a huge claim to make, but it actually behooves them profit-wise, I think, to put the humans back in, not just ethically. Right. But I think most people are realizing the actual technology is harder than people thought. You know, we're 90% of the way there, probably, but the last 10% is always the hardest part. Right, right. And that driving isn't just People have had cars, autonomous cars that could drive on the highway, you know, maybe without changing lanes uh, since the, the 1990s. That's been around. But driving in its full-blown, uh, you know, instantiation Beauty. of <laughs> what, he, you know, driving as we all do every day on different, in different kinds of uh, situations, it's really uh, almost you need all of intelligence to do it. Mm -hmm. You need common sense. Mm -hmm. And common sense is something that computers lack. And in fact, that's well known in the AI community. And there's a huge amount of money now from the government and from entrepreneurs and so on going into research on common sense. 
Well, I know you're an advocate, though, and an optimist with self-driving cars for the future. Like, you hope that they oh, yes. become... Because they're, they're, it's not hard to better a human, <laughs> on average human. Of course, 80% right. of us are better than average drivers. But uh, but I, I think it in the future, I, I agree that uh, self-driving cars would be a great way to go. Right. And I think that what what's going to have to happen is not only will the technology of self-driving cars get better, but also... The infrastructure itself will have to adapt because self-driving cars, it's going to be hard, as you say, you know, the, the very last couple of percent is going to be really hard. So, for example, one thing that a self-driving car is hard for self-driving cars to do is to figure out, like, what do you do in a construction zone? Right. How do you interpret the, like, the hand signals from the construction person guiding traffic? Well, there's going to be, have to be some other method that they can communicate with the self-driving car in a different way that is easier for the technology to deal with. And so I think the infrastructure is going to meet the technology. You know, it's going to have, both sides are going to have to adapt. That's an, that's interesting. I was talking to Matt Botvinick last week, who um, is the head of neuroscience research at DeepMind. And he said something along the same lines when talking about getting to general AI that just as important, if not more important, is giving these AI agents a new, a, a richer environment to mm. traverse through, right? And that's along the same lines because we're right now it's really limited in these games that we're giving it, and even like these, um, like first person kind of here's a triangle to go through, here's a you know thing to explore the yeah. environment, uh, and that we're limiting their learning in that respect as well. And he thinks that we could do it in the world, but that robots aren't ready and there's so many hurdles, like a self-driving car has so many hurdles to overcome that we probably should focus on a simulated environment and making that richer. Right. I, I think that's a that's the right thing to do. Of course, it's hard to capture everything about the world in a simulation. Yes. <laughs> you know, we don't live in the matrix <laughs> yet. <laughs> that we know of, yeah. And people talk about, you know, there's this notion of edge cases, mm -hmm. right? This is like a buzzword in AI. And these are the unlikely things that might happen that are outside of a machine learning systems training set. For instance, you're driving in a car and suddenly in the middle of the road, uh, there's a snowman. <laughs> I just, you know, yeah, I, like it. Uh, yeah. I don't know, some weird thing happens, but it's rare, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. But if you have self-driving, if you have millions of self-driving cars all over the world, some edge case is going to happen to each one, to, to, to many, many of those things all the time. You should plow through the snowman, right? That's what you should do, right? <laughs> Well, it's, I guess it depends. If not, not if there's a like a little kid in the process of building it, right? Of course, yeah. It really depends. So that's the uh, part of the whole common sense issue. So edge cases, you know, we talk about the long tail, right? The long tail of um, probabilities, and there's many things in the long tail that for any individual car or agent, they're not going to happen. But collectively, a lot of these edge cases or long tail cases are going to happen and humans use common sense to deal with them. Right. And they don't, you know, it's hard to get all those edge cases into si simulations. So it's not like we can just have a system that is trained on every kind of possibility. We have to have systems that are able to abstract the way humans do, make generalizations, make analogies. And that's that's really the core of what general intelligence is all about. Well, is this what you mean when you talk about the barrier of meaning and understanding and, and that that's what we're that's sort of up against in the modern deep learning environment? That's part of it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. A huge part of it is this ability we have, we humans have, to look at a situation that we're encountering and to say, this is very much like a previous situation, or this is analogous to something else that I learned about, so I know what to do here. And machines are not yet very good at that kind of generalization or analogy. There's another side of the understanding part, which is all the vast amount of background knowledge that we humans have just by living in the world, you know, by growing up and having a body in the world. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we know all kinds of things about how objects interact with other objects and how living systems are likely to work. We have the, these sort of predictive abilities about different kinds of systems that it's very hard to program in or have machines learn about. Uh, we could go down the embodied cognition road here. <laughs> Do you want to just talk about one or two ways in which uh, like a current deep learning system fails with respect to this you know, background knowledge and, and understanding and, and meaning? Sure. So here's, here's one example. You can train um, a deep learning system to recognize a school bus in photos and videos, et cetera. They can just, you know, you show it a picture of a school bus and it says school bus. 90, 96% correct, right? Something like that. Yeah, or even 100% correct, perhaps. School buses are easy. However, people have shown that, for instance, photos of school buses, if you add some kind of filter to the image, like that blurs it in certain ways, the deep learning system no longer can recognize it, even though it's quite recognizable to humans. Humans will get a hundred percent still. Yeah, essentially. Uh, whereas there's some kind of feature that it's responding to when it says, yes, I'm, this is a school bus that's different from what humans are responding to. And then going further, the deep learning system doesn't, it doesn't really know what a school bus is. It doesn't know that a school bus usually drives children to school. It doesn't know that a school bus in the middle of the af in, in like the middle of the afternoon, you know, one o'clock p.m., it's likely to be empty because school goes from you know eight to two or whatever. It doesn't know that the driver is usually an adult. <laughs> you know, it, there's all kinds of things about these concepts that we just know that these machine learning systems. There's really no clear way to teach them all these things. So this is actually something that you're working on. And um, how is this related to the Situate system that you're oh, working yeah. on? You want to just tell us about that real quickly? Or, yeah. You know? I mean, I don't think but, uh, this is sort of the research so, so that my research group is working on right now. It's mm -hmm. not going to solve this problem per okay. se. But okay. we're, we're trying to get computers to make sense of what we call visual situations. That is, um, instead of just identifying an object, like, oh, that's a school bus, mm -hmm. oh, that's a, you know, that's a Dalmatian, that's a lamppost, mm -hmm. to try and make sense of how the objects interact with each other. So, you know, if I say this is a, a situation of a school bus picking up children in the morning, that's a different situation from a school bus driving and then a group of children doing something else. You know, I can identify a group of children, I can identify school bus, but school bus picking up children is a whole situation that where the, the objects are related to one another and the actions of the objects are doing certain things. So, and, and so it's what, what's called situational awareness in human parlance, right? Uh, Visual situational awareness, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, you could call it that if you want. Oh, right. well, I was wondering if that's where the inspiration for the name uh, came no, from. Yeah. I that's I see that as more of like a I don't know it's more of a like a situational awareness has kind of a military connotation. Oh, does it really? Somehow, yeah. I don't. I mean, I think that's a term that that like DARPA has used for some of its uh, programs. All right, I'll just I'll delete that whole segment then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but recognizing situations—that's something that humans do. That's all they do mm -hmm. in some sense. And we do it in a very flexible way. And computers are not so good at doing that. Well, okay. So just to go back to uh, your example of the school bus. So w what you're describing is called an adversarial example, right? Where you can trick a machine learning algorithm very easily. So I wasn't, when I talked about blurring filters, that actually wasn't an adversarial example. That was just doing some manipulation to the image. That's right. So maybe an you could... An adversarial example, mm -hmm. yeah. An adversarial example is... Uh, kind of a, an intentional, malicious manipulation of the image so that the image is not, to a human, the image is not changed at all. Looks exactly looks the exactly same. exactly the same. Yeah. But you've added some very carefully structured uh, um, changes to individual pixels in the image so that it will fool the neural network to thinking that the uh, image is something completely different, like an ostrich 
These are easier to describe with pictures too, but I'm, I'm yeah. sure that you painted it well for the listeners. So, yeah. So you can, um, and this is, this is again, getting at the point that machines are not perceiving visual scenes in the same way that humans do. Right. They see them very, very differently. And that makes them vulnerable to these kinds of um, malicious uh, attacks. And it's not just images. People have shown that you can do this with sound. You know, I can take a, a something that you're saying uh, and I can make change so that to humans it doesn't change it at all, but to your smart speaker, Alexa, whatever, it, it thinks it's it's saying something completely different, whatever I want it to say. The waveforms are changed enough that, yeah, yeah. it encodes that, that difference, huh? Yeah. And you can do it to, uh, for instance, people have shown that you can create these stickers that you can stick on stop signs so that a self-driving car thinks it's a speed limit sign or something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's so much room for foibles in this world, you know. And right. And these these are only the things that, like, the good guys have been showing, look, this is a problem. You can do this. But, you know, there's bad guys out there, too, that are trying to come up with attacks on these systems. Right. They're not being so upfront about it, perhaps. Right. Exactly. They're not publishing their results. So in your talks, you give a lot more examples of, of all these shortcomings of the current state of deep learning. Yes. Yes, you can... Recognize a bus 100% of the time in the pictures, but here's what you can't do. Uh, so we won't go through all of them. One of them that I thought was interesting, given that I uh, spoke with Matt Botvinnik last week, is the inability for an AI system currently to explain its decisions. And so I should say, in all of these domains, there are people working on all of these things, which is a great thing. I mean, it's, it's producing a lot of work and a, a lot of good work. So the inability to explain its decisions is kind of the black box problem wrapped up with the black box problem of we don't even understand ourselves how they came to the decision and they can't explain it to us. So how would we, you know, really interpret what they're uh, doing? And one of his recent papers, they tr they're trying to build theory of mind into AI systems so that they're not explaining what all the units are doing, but making an abstract concept that then they can explain to humans and to other AI agents at the abstract level, like more like what humans do. So I thought it was an, it's an interesting, uh, he says cheeky. Uh, I thought it was an interesting push as well into that. But. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's something that, um, one of my fellow graduate students working with Douglas Hofstadter also worked on. Um, mm. we had a system that could, uh, make analogies in a very, um, idealized world, you know, simulated world, if you will. And, my colleague Jim Marshall wrote a program that could would give a kind of running narrative of what the system was in some sense thinking about as but, it processed. This is not your copycat program. Well, it, this is a program called Metacat, okay. which <clears throat> reasoned, reasoned about what copycats was thinking about in some sense. I see. So copycat was your dissertation work? Is yes. That, yeah. That's right. But this whole idea of theory of mind is something that we humans have. It's very important to us because we're social creatures, right? Sure. We, we have to be able to predict what other people are thinking about, what they're feeling, what they're about to do. But it's very hard. Something that in uh, AI has been around for a long time, the, trying to do that. But uh, it's very difficult. Well, we, we don't even understand the neuroscience of theory of mind. So no. And that's, you know, a big issue. I think we don't understand neuroscience. And I think people underestimate the complexity of it. Hey, now, I'm a neuroscientist. Take it easy. Of course, <laughs> of course, we don't understand no. anything. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty complex system. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really com complicated and, and it's hard to understand. I mean, there, there's so much going on in there. Just to sort of wrap up this, the AI part of our little discussion here, I, I'm curious, given your article and, and what we've just been talking about, your best guess, what do you think the proportion of AI researchers that believe, hey, like this is the real time that we're, we're at the cusp now of general AI, we just need to figure out a couple more things. What proportion of AI researchers do you think are of that opinion? Wow. It kind of depends on what you call a re AI researcher, but I would say very small. Very small. Yes. Maybe 5%. Oh, that's reassuring. Okay. I, that's a guess. What is your outlook for 
implementing these things that are needed, this common sense, understanding, background information, um, for implementing enough to, I won't say for implementing general AI, but maybe let's say for, for getting on the right track to eventually implement general AI once we tweak and figure out how they all work together, but right. where all these necessary ingredients will come together. Right. Again, it depends on what you mean by general AI, but if, if you want to um, have something that in some sense can do everything that a human can do in the same way a human can. and Let, Let's call that general AI. Yeah. I'm definitely co come over to the embodied AI cool. uh, side where I really don't think that without having something like a body that's acting in the world, the same world we are, that we're going to get there. That's my feeling. And do you think that we need to emulate human brain processes and human cognitive processes to get there? Or is there another way? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, it's possible there's another way, but I don't think anyone has any clue what it could be. Dang it. I was hoping that you would tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, but uh, I think our best bet is to look look more at our own brain processes and cognitive processes. Well, I want to hear how complexity figures into all of this because you are a complexity expert. And and by the way, I'm just uh, a couple hours from Santa Fe. So ah. next time you're down there, uh, 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 I want to go. I know it's where, hard to- Where I, are you? I'm in Durango, Colorado. I'm a retired okay. neurophysiologist, right? So, okay. <laughs> so anyway, and, and uh, we have family in Albuquerque, but- I hadn't, haven't had a good reason yet to visit the Santa Fe Institute. And I know it's a small institute and that it's hard to go visit right? because people internally need to invite people. I'm not asking you to invite Well, you me. can, anyone can go visit. I mean, you can go there, you can tour the institute, you can huh. go to lectures there. It's open, totally open. In terms of going there as an official visitor, you know, where you're actually like a research visitor. Not just a creep walking around, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, that, someone has to invite you, right. I see. But what am I going to get uh, from going there that I can't get on expl uh, complexityexplorer.org? Aha. Uh -huh. These days, because it's exploded. Yeah. There's so much stuff there. Yeah. So. No, that's a great question. Um. You know, you can meet the people who are there actually in real life. But Complexity Explorer is definitely a great place to start if you're interested in complex systems and want to learn something about it. So so what is complexity? What is complexity? <laughs> well, yeah, but yeah. I, it's kind of a mysterious term, right? Right. And it's maybe not the best term. It's sort of a term that we landed on to describe sort of phenomenon in which you have many relatively simple elements that are collectively producing behavior that uh, we like to call complex. It's it's a little circular. When you talk about it in your talks, it's almost like it's this compilation of different properties, right? So you can describe right. the properties of a complex system and then put it all together. And that's what, that's what complexity is. Is that exactly maybe? right? I think it start, you know, it started because people who were studying systems like the brain, where you have trillions of neurons, and they're all communicating with each other. And it's very uh, dynamic. And out of that comes like human cognition emerges, right? Emerges, yeah. right? We don't understand it. This is one property also of a complex system it, it is emergent behavior. Is that right? You could say that. Yeah. And, you know, people are also studying things like the immune system, which has trillions of cells constantly communicating with each other, with each other. And there were a lot of analogies to the way brains operate, and the immune system operates, and same for insect colonies. and These networks. These networks. And uh, also people were studying the economy, and there was a lot of biological analogies to the way the economy works. And this is sort of the how the Santa Fe Institute got started was that there was – a group of scientists who felt like there was something very deep and universal about all these systems that needed to be understood in an interdisciplinary way, not just in these individual disciplines. And they couldn't put their finger on exactly what it was, so they called it complexity. See, this is so the Santa Fe Institute was this really early proponent of interdisciplinary work, I feel like, because 
that's what everyone does today. And that's how the graduate students are sold on a neuroscience program. Just I'm biased because I come from neuroscience. And if you're not interdisciplinary today, you, you don't make the cut. I don't know. P being in a university, I could say that what's called interdisciplinary, sure. <laughs> like it may be in neuroscience, it's, it's, you know, cellular versus systems neuroscience. That's interdisciplinary. All I'm saying is you need to use the word if you're the program. You yes. have to use the word these days. You have to use, yeah, the word interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and, you know, transformational and <laughs> collaborative, <laughs> collaborative. Right. Yes. Buzzwords. Yeah. But is, it, at Santa Fe Institute, I, I think they take it very seriously, and it's much more interdisciplinary than any university I've ever seen, because you really do get economists talking to neuroscientists, trying to try and understand what's common among the kinds of things they're looking at. It just kind of emerges, if you will, out of the goal of understanding complexity, because there are so many different complex systems from so many different disciplines that it it only makes sense to bring them all together. That's the hypothesis. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> one of the things I uh one of the properties of a complex system that you mention in in your talks uh is that they have limited centralized control. Mhm. Mm what does that really mean? I think I know what it means, but can you just describe what that means? Sure. So if you think about the brain, for example, and all these trillions of neurons, as far as I know, there's no small set of neurons that are in charge. There's no homunculus. Right. There's no nothing in the brain that's kind of overlooking the whole system and saying, you know, you do this and you do this and you're in charge of this and you're in charge of this. Instead, it's decentralized. Each neuron does what it does which is a function of sort of its particular biology and its connections with other, you know, cells in the brain. Mm -hmm. And somehow out of that whole cacophony of decentralized entities, you get what feels like organized behavior. <laughs> what feels like. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of the idea. Very good. So, so this show is about the the bringing together of neuroscience and artificial intelligence and, and sort of what they can teach each other, how they're separate, how they're disparate, how, what's common to them. And I'm wondering if you have ideas on how complexity can help bridge the gap, uh, any gap between AI and neuroscience. Like how, how does it fit into that world? Does okay. That, does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think I have some ideas about that. Um so one of the things that people in complex systems talk about a lot is information in, in a very abstract sense that all s these complex systems are in some sense processing information. Like Shannon entropy information or, or information in a broader sense? I would say information in a broader sense. Okay. And one of the research topics is try really trying to pin down what that means, <laughs> processing information. What does that mean? How do we quantify that? And Shannon information is one way, but it's not the whole story. And processing information is closely related to computation. Mm -hmm. And some people would say that the brain is a computer. The brain is taking inputs, doing computations and producing outputs, you know, right. complex system in complex systems. And certainly, you know, AI, that's what you do in AI. And so, some people in AI are trying to say, well, okay, what kinds of computations does the brain do? And um, how do we emulate that in a computer? But I think in complex systems, people are thinking about like, what is computation? What are the mechanisms of computation in all of these complex systems? It's not like a standard von Neumann computer. You don't have a CPU. You don't have sort of random access memory and all that stuff. You don't have logical chips that do logical operations. Right. Somehow all of this is emergent. And complex systems is really trying to characterize the kinds of computations done by complex systems in this, in this very collective way, sort of collective computation. And so Santa Fe Institute is very, that's a very important theme. And I think that understanding that kind of general idea of collective computation in complex systems is going to be relevant both to neuroscience and thinking about how the brain works and also to AI and thinking about how to try and emulate 
the kinds of things the brain does to produce intelligence. So I, I'm a, by training, I'm a monkey neurophysiologist, right? So, <laughs> um, and, I, and I've done some decision-making modeling with stochastic accumulators that I won't get into. And frankly, I'm of limited intelligence. So I view <laughs> most of what I think about in this realm through the lens of a like neurophysiology, right? Sticking mm -hmm. electrodes in the brain. Right. What lens do you, because you're, you have these multifaceted expertise, what, what, when you're thinking about a problem, do you view it through the lens of complexity or through the lens of computation, machine learning? How do you approach these problems? Uh, wow. That's a hard question. I, you know, I try and try and switch lenses when I can to try <laughs> nice. and get new perspectives. And that's something that SFI has helped me in. Uh, I was going to say another way to think about complex systems is in terms of di dynamics. Dynamical systems is a mathematical area that tries to characterize how systems change um, over time. You know, it's kind of the foundation of calculus uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, and but it's also it dynamical systems theory is becoming really relevant both in AI and in neuroscience as a way to right. to analyze these systems I'm not sure that it's a causal description that people could argue about that but and people do argue about that but but it is becoming a very important way of looking at it right and so it's kind of an alternative to computation it's a different lens so looking at it through the lens of computation and looking at it through the lens of dynamics kind of give you a different view. So one example, um, as a neuroscientist, if you've looked at like the visual system or maybe any system in the brain, one thing that, that really stands out is how much feedback connections there are. Sure. You know, I, my neuroscience friends, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I have some friends. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah. And they tell me that in at least the visual cortex, there's 10 times as many feedback connections as there are feed forward connections, which is amazing given that most of AI, most of deep learning uses feed forward networks entirely. And one of the reasons for that is it works for the kinds of tasks people are looking at. And also it's hard to get systems with feedback to work well. It's more difficult to make them do what you want them to do. There's been a lot of progress in that, but yes, that's, that's right. very true. And so somehow, so the question is like, what, is, what does that feedback gain us? And in complex, complexity, people look at that kind of idea across a lot of different systems, you know. There's a lot of um, idea that biological systems, including the brain, the immune system, uh, hmm. cell, cellular metabolisms, all of these systems, there, there's a huge amount of regulation that's essential for, to get these systems to work. And a lot of the feedback connections are involved in regulation. That's something that AI might take some notice of because maybe one of the reasons that we're not so easy to fool with adversary examples is we have all this feedback from higher layers of the brain that are kind of regulating what our lower visual system is, is doing. That's, a, that's an interesting take because a lot of people talk about the feedback connections being predictive as well. So it's like a, right. a model that's, that's been too. predicting and, and then there's a... I think that's true. But, you know, regulation is a very big deal in biology. Yeah, it sure is. I, I really hadn't thought that much about, about the feedback signal in a regulatory role. So I'll have to look more into that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we have a, a little bit more time. So thank you. For, um, I, I really wanted to get your take and, and you gave a nice take on how complexity kind of fits into this uh, whole system fits into neuroscience uh, and AI. Okay, so uh, I always have this last little section where I kind of open it up and then and ask some broader, more general questions. Uh, so do you think that uh, like a general theory of the brain or, or intelligence might come from neuroscience or complexity theory, which complexity, as I understand it, is still looking for a, its own theory, a general theory, right? <laughs> Or, or, or will artificial intelligence work help figure out what intelligence is and, and how the brain works? I don't think any one of those fields is going to produce a general theory. You know, Do you think a, a general theory will be produced? Is producible? I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, again, not sure what general theory, the goal of a general theory is, is it to predict, you know, so that I could predict everything about 
what you do? Uh, no, I don't think you're going to get something that's going to be able to do detailed prediction, mm -hmm. but something that's going to help us understand much better how the system works and be able to create an intelligent system, a non-biological intelligent system. I do think that we'll be able to do that eventually. I just think it's a very, very hard thing and it's going to take a lot of time. You still, that's your outlook is, uh, let's see, best guess. What year? <laughs> I'm not going to guess. Oh, come on. I it's... absolutely cannot guess. And <laughs> okay. everybody who guesses ends up being horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> That's the fun thing about guessing. If you know that going in and admit, I know I'm wrong, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, here's, here's a related well, question. Well, let me say yeah. this. That there's a quote I have in my book, which is from back in the, the 60s or something. Someone said that artificial intelligence is at least a hundred Nobel prizes away. Oh, that was like the only right person in the history of right. this, right? And there's no Nobel prize in artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, <laughs> but in terms of understanding biology, the understanding that we're going to have to have of biology or the kinds of breakthroughs that we need to, you know, might not be a Nobel prize literally, but right. that kind of breakthrough. Right. I kind of agree with that. So if you, if you, had to be cryogenically frozen uh, for a period of time, and and then you get to wake up. <laughs> How many years would you? Oh boy, you're taking a big risk because you know the you're asking is civilization going to last right. as long as it's going to take? <laughs> right. Well, that that gives you have me all some these breakthroughs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Well, no, but I I just mean when do you want to? When would you want to wake up and see where we are? Not necessarily. When would you when would you wake up and think that it that what we had just spoke about had happened? I'm just saying you personally, if you had to be frozen and right. and then thawed, when 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 would you want to be thawed? Well, I'd be a little bit afraid if I said like a hundred years from now that I'd be thawed and we'd you know be in some horrible dystopian uh, <laughs> climate disaster. And yes, this this tells me a lot about you. Yes, yes, go on. Yeah. <laughs> So I, you know, you I don't want to be frozen at all. You could say one day. That's the shortest period. So you'd go one day? Yeah, I will, I, I'm pretty happy being in the present. Okay. Very good. <laughs> you and I are different people. What, what do you think? What's one trait of our intelligence uh, that will really be difficult to build into general AI? And we've talked about multiple facets of this, I suppose. Yeah, I think this whole idea of common sense, however you want to define it, is going to be really difficult. That's going to be the big, okay. Yeah. And, you know, DARPA right now has a program called Machine Common Sense. They're putting a lot of money into funding. Oh, cool. um, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, before mm -hmm. he died, he gave a lot of money, I think like $120 million or more, to the Allen Institute for AI that he founded to study, specifically to study common sense and how to get computers to have common sense. There's going to be more and more attention given to this, but no one really knows how to how how to do it, or how to really even to approach it at this point. Yeah, so. or even how to define define the term. Will uh, will complexity lead complexity theory lead to an understanding of consciousness? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't know. Where's your brandy? Where's your brandy in your desk? You can right. have a little. That's right. Yeah. If con or or perhaps complexity theory will sort of. As Dan Dennett says, explain away consciousness. Oh, are you a are you a explain away consciousness kind of person? I am, I think. Yeah. I, I'm not so convinced that I think it's kind of a catch all term that as we get more as we understand more and more how the brain works, that we're gonna say, okay, that was kind of a that was kind of a red herring. Marvin Minsky <laughs> calls it a suitcase term. That's like his concept, uh, which I'm coming to I'm coming to agree with that. And I've read I read Dennett a long time ago and I, you you know he it's a type that you have to read over and over to revisit to really uh let it sink in but the more people I talk to who have this share this vision it gives me a little more confidence in my own that consciousness will be explained away isn't a thing per se, you know. So, okay. Uh what's something that that's someone might find hard to fathom, like that um, is a little bit out there, something that you believe that's a little bit out there maybe uh, that we might discover about ourselves 
or intelligence as a result of research in AI or complexity or, or neuroscience? That we would discover about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Or our intelligence or, you know. Yeah. That we don't have free will. Oh, okay. So you think that's <laughs> going to be sort of a, so there'll, there'll be some sort of proof because there's a lot of anti-free willers right now too. Yeah. Gosh, we, we, we do share some views then, so. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question, Melanie. What is one thing that you have failed at? Uh, you've had a lot of success. What's one thing that you failed at and, and how did you come back from it? Oh, boy. Um... <laughs> one, one thing. You can only choose one thing here. Oh, wow. Yeah, so all through high school and through much of college, my goal was to be a physicist and I wanted to be a cosmologist. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was my dream. And I really found physics too hard. Which, which the Newtonian or the electrical or all of it? <laughs> I think all of it. Yeah. <laughs> I just was not very good at it. <laughs> I struggled and struggled, and I just couldn't do it. So I gave up my dream of majoring in physics and going to graduate school in physics. And that was very difficult, I have mm. to say. Um, kind of beat my head against that wall for a long time and ended up in computer science, which is ironic because it turns out that a lot of the physicists I know, people who studied cosmology, in fact, <laughs> ended up in computer science as well, or neuroscience or social science. <laughs> is that because employment for physicists wasn't high or? I think a little bit of that and also that they they got a little fed up with the whole how how abstract and theoretical and untestable it was all getting, yeah, like with string theory and all that stuff. So is that how you finally let it go and thought it's okay? No, I let it go way before that. I, I just, it wasn't, it wasn't making me happy. No, I mean, is that when you let it go, stopped beating yourself oh. up over it? Oh, yeah, maybe. Hmm. And then I married a physicist and kind of <laughs> got to know one and, and found out that I was actually happy where I was. And there's really, you know, they're not great people either, right? <laughs> they can be great people. Yeah. I, I, I have many physicists who are my closest friends and my, my husband's a physicist. And I know. I, I just, think they're great. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I let it go. Well, okay. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for sharing your time with me, Melanie. So people can find you on Twitter at MelMitchell1. And I again, I will link to your website and complexity explorer.org. And um, is there any other way that you'd like people to find out more about you? Uh, I think that that would be the best. And um, of course, I'll link to your classic now classic book, uh, <laughs> Complexity, a guided tour. So yeah, and I'll be I'll be putting information about my new book on my website when, cool. when it's available. And people can follow you on Twitter. And I'm sure that you will tweet about that as well. Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. congratulations on the book. And um, again, thanks for talking with me and continued success to you. Thank you so much. This has been really fun. Brain Inspired is a production of me. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling two or four dollars per month. Go to patreon.com slash braininspired or go to the website braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help keep this show going without any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair